2, verse number 10. Now we could read all the way from the beginning, but I feel like the Lord wants me to focus upon this one word that He gave me. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can read along. If not, I will read it for you. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10. While you're turning there, for those that are going to turn, uh, we are streaming live on Wednesday night. Had a lot of people viewed it from Facebook. If you happen to have Facebook, get up with some of these people if they hadn't already shared. I don't know how all that stuff works, but you probably know better than I do. But I think you got to be shared on there to be a, be a part of it. But um, spread the word. There's a lot of people that are sitting home that has nothing to do. But that doesn't mean we don't have to have nothing to do. We can read the Bible. We can pray. Uh, there's a lot of times that I think about when people get really, really bored. And I'm not saying bored because it's, it, it don't take long to get bored around the house. But when they get really, really bored and they just peer going into depression, that lets us know that maybe some of those things in our lives may have been God's. Now that we can't do it, it's like we can't function no more to stay at home. But uh, maybe we can use this time to spend more time in God's Word, spend more time in prayer, and spend time with our family. Amen? Yeah. But it, it'll be on 6.30 on Wednesday night, streaming live from the house is what we're doing, so... Some were saying it may have been blurry. I don't know exactly what all went on with that. Some was, some wasn't. So we're going to do our very best if you want to tune us in then. And uh, the services will be the same for a while. We thank God for our, our uh, leadership in our country allowing us to do this drive-in. Um, I mean, they could have banned it all, but I thank God they didn't. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10 says this, For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for your people that have showed up today, God. Thank you for the ones that are viewing online. I pray, God, that your word will go forth with power, Lord. You'd give me that anointing to speak. Give me that anointing to think, God, that I might be able to have an ear to hear what the Spirit of the Lord has to say unto the church, God. Let my tongue be the pen of a ready writer, that I may be able to speak those things which become sound doctrine. That when I give account of judgment, I may hear the words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter in with no blood upon my hands, Lord. I pray today that if there's anybody here today, God, that may not be ready, there may be some that's watching that may not be ready to go. We are all scared of this virus. Some, some people are. They, they're afraid of what's going to happen next, but the Bible teaches us. Us that is appointed unto men wants to die, but after this the judgment, Lord. And the Bible teaches us to be ready, not get ready. We need to be ready. So I pray that first ones that are watching online, there's people out here in our midst today that may not have everything under the blood. They may have been playing in the world, dibble dabble in the world. I pray today that your power come by and reprove the world of sin. Show us, God, that we have a need of a Savior today. Anoint the servant, God, that I might be able to preach today. Sometimes when you get in different places or not familiar places, it's harder to preach. I I don't want to be like the psalm that said that I hung my heart upon the willows because I was in a strange land. God, there's no place strange upon this earth. This is a secret place right now. Help us all to enter into our worship zone. There may be in a vehicle today. It may be harder to do, but I pray that you'd bless and you'd feed your people today. I pray for the abundance of my heart. My mouth for speaking. My heart may be filled with love. I'll give you praise and glory for in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's give the Lord some praise for his word today. Amen. I want to preach upon the subject that I felt like the Lord laid upon my heart today, God's work. If there's any subject that I should be able to preach upon, it should be work. I've been introduced to work since I was a baby. It might not have been me working, but my parents are hard workers. My step-parents are hard workers. I've been around work all my life. Uh, even, my, even my grandparents, most of them were hard workers. And I've had an example over the years of hard work. But uh, today, I don't really want to talk about our work as much as I want to talk about God's work. But I do want to talk just a few moments upon our work because I feel like we're living in a day and hour where work is uh, the last thing on some people's minds. We, we have people who take advantage of the government. We have people who'd rather stay at home than go to work. But how many knows the Bible said that he, don't, he that don't work don't eat? Amen. And so we need to go to work. We need to do what we can. And in this trying time that we have people who are being laid off and they're not being able to work. But I want to let you know that men, according to the book of Genesis, when man and women, when Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden, it was given a punishment that Adam, by the sweat of his brow, shall work all the days of his life. And so it's, it's, it's important to us men that, that are, you know, that are able to work. There are some people that are disabled. I thank God for the government that looks after people who are not able. I'm not talking 
talking about the people who are disabled. I'm talking about the people who are able and act like they're disabled. How many's ever seen any of those? Amen. And but nevertheless, you know, thank God for our government that that looks after people like that. But if we're able to work, our punishment in the Garden of Eden was to go to work by the sweat of thy brows. Too many times we look for easy work. We look for easy things to happen. But I want to let you know, a lot of times things good don't come out of easy. God's called us to put in an effort of hard work. And the Bible said that the woman's job was to have a baby. Uh, so I believe today that, you know, that, that we should work. But in, in my younger years, my parents could probably tell you I hated work. I didn't like to work. Even though I was around work, you can be around something and still not know what, you, you can still be around something and, and not be able to do what other people do. Just because you're around work doesn't mean that you do work. And uh, I had a hate for it. I, I felt like it was always punishment. I mean, back in the teenage years, I can remember, there's a lot of teenagers that sleep, and they stay in the bed all day long. My parents wouldn't let me do that. I mean, I'd be gone out all night long, spend all night out, and the next thing you know, crack of daylight, we'd be up in a garden or something, a hole in the garden, a water the garden, or, or I can remember on prom nights, even in my junior, my senior year, all my friends be out painting the town, and my dad would have me in the cabinet shop, and I would ask him, Dad, why do you make me work? when all my other friends got and he'd say as long as I got you at work I got you out of trouble so I never did like work but now I do I got saved and I got God on the inside of me and I like to work some of you out there may like to work I see people who has been retired that you still won't stop working and oh, I see you all the time working. And hats off to you. I believe work sometimes helps us to make it through the day. The, uh, we've always heard that an idle mind is what? A devil's workshop. And sometimes just laying around not doing nothing can cause us to be tempted by things, can cause us to think upon things that we shouldn't be thinking upon. So I do want to say today that if you're not a worker, you need to become a worker, especially if you're a man. Hats off to the ladies that, you know, that have kept their house up, that has trained up their children, has been there for their kids, and still put on the workman's shoes and goes out and be a virtuous woman. The Bible teaches us she's worthy of praise, a virtuous woman. The ones that can wear many shoes in a day's time that can mop, that can sweep, that can cook, that can clean the house and take care of the kids and get them off to school and still go and make a dollar. How many is thankful for virtuous women? Amen. There ought to be some men out there that's got a little change in your pocket. I ought to blow your horn for that. Uh, we, we praise God. But nevertheless, there's times in our life, you know, that uh, you know that we don't put forth effort. That was another thing before I get into God's work today is a lot of times we don't put forth the effort that we need to. I mean, if, if somebody's willing to hire you and willing to pay you, you ought to be able to willing to work for what you get. Amen. You shouldn't be overpaid. You shouldn't be making more money than what you're worth is what I'm trying to say. You ought to put forth an effort. And I think to this, I, I thought upon this as I was praying upon this message. You know, in Ecclesiastes, the Word of God says that uh, if you find something to do, if you find something to do with your hand, whatsoever your hand findeth to do, do it with all your might. I'm thinking to myself, if we're going to find something to do, we need to be looking for something to do. You'd be surprised, and we're not very guilty of that here at Oak Grove, Simile God, praise God for it. But there's a lot of people that go to church and never have a job in the church. They never do nothing for the Lord. I believe if we come to the house of God, we ought to be looking for a job. Pastor, can I do this? Pastor, can I do that? Over the years, I have seen folk that come to the house of God, and in two weeks' time, they got a calling of ministry on their life. They want to preach. They want a pulpit. They want a microphone. And I'm thinking, excuse me, I'm sorry for being rude, but did you skip the vacuum cleaner? There's a, there's a mop in there. There's a pan to cook some food in. There's something to do because the Bible says that when he's faithful over a few things, you shall be made ruler over many. Praise God. How many knows God takes you from glory to glory, but we need to start on the bottom? And so we need to put forth effort. How many has ever uh, uh, been a part of something or another? Maybe you was in a team or maybe you was on a, a job and you worked for more people than yourself and you had somebody that didn't put forth an effort. And it feels like you had to take up their slack. You ever been there before where it just felt like, man, they was drawing a paycheck but they wasn't putting forth an effort? I tell you, the world's worst stuff nowadays is people playing on their phones when they should be working. Uh-oh. <laughs> didn't hit many toots on that one. People can't live without their phones. It's like we can't eat dinner without our phones. We can't work without our phones. But how many knows the boss man ain't paying us to look on our phones? 
If we get caught up, we may want to take a look at our phone. But the thing about it is, people stay on their phones, but we don't get paid to put on our phone, play on our phones. But we have been paid to do our job, and we need to do it with all of our might. If we find something another to do, we need to do it with all of our might. We need to put forth an effort. Praise God. God, we reward those who diligently seek Him. Hard work. We need to put our hands to the plow and not look back. Do everything we can for the Lord because the Bible teaches us once we go to the grave, we can't do nothing down there. It's time to work today while there's there's daylight. The Bible said the night's coming when no man shall be able to work. If you don't like work, just try it. And I'm not only talking about physical work as much as I'm talking about spiritual work. I praise God. You know, I came here this morning. I was going to try to put it all out by myself. They got these rules where you really can't get out of your vehicles very much. So I was going to try to set all this stuff up. No, I had people here that had their hands. They was working on this. I want to thank God for the labors that we have here at Oak Grove Assembly. God, some of this may be preaching to the choir. You may already be involved. But I want to let you know, you know, there's there's certain times that people are work hard for money but won't work hard for charity but I, I, I'm like this when I do something for the Lord I don't want to, I want to, I don't want to charge him nothing amen it, you know there are times that the labor is worthy of his hire there are times that there will be positions such as pastor where God will bless you but you know there, there ought to be a time and an attitude within inside of you that I don't charge God nothing I already owe him more than I'm ever 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 able to pay him back and if I owe him more than I'm ever able to pay him back I want to do what I can and when I do it I want to work just as hard for free as I would for money Oh, he'll get some people right there. You know, there's a lot of people that work hard for the almighty dollar. But if we had to do a charity work for somebody, I wonder if you would put forth the same effort you would if you was getting paid. I, I want to let you know we serve a God who watches you in the quiet places, who watches you in the secret places. He watches what you do for people. He watches how you treat people. There's a lot of people, you know, I, I can remember when I first started church in full gospel, I wanted to do something for the Lord. God had done so much for me, I wanted to do something for Him. And as I got there, Mr. Tom was an elderly man, and he was, he was mowing the grass at the church. I didn't want a pulpit position. I was too scared to get behind a pulpit. Still have a lot of fear with it, but I know God's done too much for me to meet Him, deny Him of the calling that He's put me to. But nevertheless, I would ask Him. I didn't take His job from Him. I would ask Him if He needed any help. And so I would run the weed eater, and I would weed eat as he began to cut grass. I didn't care what I was doing. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than dwell in the tents of the wicked. I just want to be busy about the Father's business. I don't want to get too busy in my life that I can't do nothing for God who's doing, done so much for me. And so I started weed eating. The next thing you know, Mr. Tom passed that down to me. And he said, here, man, I'm getting, I'm getting a little in the age now. You're a young man. You take over it and you do it. So I did it. And let me, let me, let me just drop this in uh, on some of you that may help you out. You know, we're from the country, and, you know, there's a lot of times that we use Roundup. And I'm not, I'm not going to condemn you if you use Roundup. But nevertheless, I started Roundup and around the church, and everything started dying and drying. And I tell you what, some of them older cats that were there at the time, they didn't like it. And they came and told me, look, now, he's always weed eating around. We need to weed eat. We need to quit Roundupping. And I was like, you know, he, they got a point. That takes effort. But there's sometimes when we are working for charity, we're not getting paid for it. We have an attitude to say, well, they ought to be grateful that I'm I'm just doing something. But that's the wrong attitude to have. If we're going to do something for the Lord, we need to do it with all of our might. We need to do it just like we were getting paid thousands of dollars because I want to let you know the work that you do behind the scenes where nobody else can see you. God is grading you and He's going to put you in a place one day that you might be able to prosper but you've got to be able to work when there's no money coming back. You need to be able to work when it's all for free. Amen? Now that was the side trail. That was a long side trail. You better be glad it didn't have no forks in the road. I'd stay there all day long. I want to talk about God's work today. The Bible said we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works. Now that word, I began to look that word up and I didn't look it up in the Greek. Maybe I should have, but we do have an English translation that translates it pretty, pretty, uh, pretty close. And that word workmanship means the, the, the synonym that I got from that word is art. That's the only thing that helped me out to figure out what workmanship means. Art. How many knows God is one of the best artists there ever has been? If, if you live in the country, go out maybe on the river or something in, in, in the evening time when it's a pretty day and the clouds are all shadowed about. 
Go by and, and, and watch the sun set and the few little clouds and look at the beautiful art that he paints in the sky. But you know what God began to speak to my heart and say? He said, if I can do that for the clouds, wonder what I can do for my children. Amen? We are his workmanship. We are his piece of art that God's working on us. But over the years of working in carpenter work, one of the things that gets on boss men's nerves is for whoever that has hired you to come over there and watch over your shoulder every move that you make. Now, there are people who have hired people, and they're antsy, and they're, they're, they're anxious about seeing uh, the, the work through with. And they'll watch, and they'll watch. But it's hard for a labor to work when you have somebody standing over and you're watching every move you make. Most of the time, the people who are watching has no clue what's going on. All they know is how they want it to look when it gets through with. And so they may even come in there and question you. Why does this look like that? Why does that look like this? But the thing about it is you hired them to do it. If you hired them to do it, go sit in there and find your TV show to watch so they get through. And if it's not like you want it, then you can call them back and say, this is not what we agreed on. I come to tell somebody today, your life may not always look like you think it ought to look before God gets through with it. But somebody shout today, he's still working on me. Every time that he strikes that paintbrush across your paper, he's putting something other else down that's going to look good when he's through a lot of times we look at our lives man when God's painting our lives and it don't always look like we think it ought to look there's too many times people misjudge us and prejudge us and 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 and, and think that you know we should look a little bit different or we should be acting a little bit different things are not going just the way they think it ought to should but I'm here to tell you if you got your faith in God God has took you to the potter's house and he's still working on you he's molding you into who he wants you to be and I like this saying that he is not done with me yet I'm not who I want to be but I'm not who I was I'm better than I was yesterday every Every single day, God is painting a picture. And just like us carpenters or somebody else that you've hired that don't like people sitting over their shoulders and watching every little move they make, God, I don't believe God likes people just sitting over his shoulders and questioning his work that he's doing. Some of us say, well, I don't understand why God's letting this happen in my life. And I don't understand why my life looks like this. Listen, he's told us in his word that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ Jesus, he's making you a little bit more like Christ each and every day. And we ought to just pray. God that I'm not who I used to be. I may not be where I need to be but I'm not who I was. So help us not to judge ourselves to the, to the state of criticism where we think you know that I should be better off than what I am. I should be further along than what I am. Man God's painting you. You just allow. You know there's a time that people who like to work they like to do it themselves. But I find too often in life that salvation doesn't work for people because they're too busy trying to do it themselves. Can I tell you, when God's work happens, God is the one who's working. You're just yielding to what God is doing in your life. I'm reminded in the book of Leviticus, if I'm not mistaken, how the Ark of the Covenant was to be toted on staves. And they was toting the Ark of the Covenant. And he had a certain people, the Levites, were to handle the, the Ark of the Covenant. And they hit a bump in the road. Maybe you remember the story. They hit a bump in the road. And somebody just had a good heart. They said, well, I'm going to stop by and help it because I don't want the Word of God to fail. I don't want the Ark of the Covenant to fail. I don't want the presence of God to fail. So they put their hand to the Ark of the Covenant. And the Bible said, that God himself struck him dead. I thought to myself, that sounds like a harsh God. Why would he strike somebody dead that was trying to do a good deed? But I come to let you know today that God doesn't need any help doing his part. We must surrender all and get out of the way and let God have his way. Amen. I'm reminded of Abraham that wanted a son. He wanted a child. When you go to talking about children, you get personal with a lot of people. But God will not have no other God before him, even if it's your child. Even if it's a child that you want. Even if it's a child you don't have and it's a dream. Whatever it is. But God told Brother Abraham, I'm going to give you a child. You're going to have a child. But the Bible said that years rolled on and there was no child. And just like the good-hearted man that was going to catch the Ark of the Covenant, Abraham and Sarah had a good idea. They thought, we'll just go into my, my bondmaid, Hagar. We'll have a child. We'll do it for God. God doesn't need our help. We need to hear that today. We are His workmanship. He's not ours. It's not our picture that we're painting. It's His picture. 
We have become his picture. And when it don't look like you think it ought to look, listen. Stay on the artboard. Continue allowing God to paint your picture. Because the Bible says, Blessed are those that wait upon the Lord. They shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. It may not look just right just yet, but He makes everything beautiful in His time. Amen. Praise God. It's been many times I look at my life and I, I, I feel like maybe I'm not who God wants me to be. Maybe I should be doing more. I'm a big criticizer of myself, on myself. I criticize myself. Well, you need to get better at this. You need to get better at that. But listen, we're all a part of God's artwork. And if you're on the board this morning, you've put your heart, you've, you've given Jesus Christ your life, you've presented your body, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, let God work on you. There's some things that you want done in your life, but you have got to allow God to do it. There's so many people that says that when I quit drinking, I'm going to come to church. How about you come to church and let God work on your drinking? He will do it. Can I get an amen today? Some of you have been out there before. Some of you tried it on your own. Some of you have tried self-righteousness, but we know according to the word of God that is filthy rags drinking is one of the sins that we all talk about but there's a lot more out there the Bible teaches us that all liars will have their part in the lake of fire some of us can't live without lying and we're going to quit lying before we come to God I come to tell you today that you need to come to God and let him help you quit lying it's God that's going to do it through you he said he came unto his own but his own received him not but to many as came to him then he gave therefore power that we should become the sons of God if we could do it on our own we wouldn't need God to do it but God is saying it's time for you to enter into his rest it's time for you to pull back your hands throw your hands in the air of surrender all and said God I can't stop worrying without your help I can't stop fretting without your help I can't stop lying without your help take my picture mess it all up if you've got to take it back to the potter's wheel and start all over I'm talking about a God that will start all over in your life he can't paint on the the same page that you've been painting on because you've messed your life up. He said we must have new wine skins because what he's about to do in our lives, we can't handle it with old wine skins. I preached a message upon those wine skins once upon a time. Those wine skins were to hold wine in as it fer fermented. And as it fermented, it would stretch. The pressure of the fer fermentation would stretch the wine skins. And that's how Jesus likens our salvation. He says, I can't put my power inside of you because when I start stretching you, if I leave you with the same old heart. I mean, those we serve a God of heart surgery that can take an old stony heart out and put in a heart of flesh. Amen. <laughs> You need a new heart. That's what he said. I put a new heart with inside of you. There's so many people trying to clean up the old heart. God said that old heart ain't no good no more. You're trying to put a pacemaker in to keep that old heart going. I'm not talking about a physical heart. I'm talking about a spiritual heart. We keep on trying it. We trying it. But when are we going to come to our ends of our rope and come to the beginning of God's rope and say, God, I can't do this on my own. I've messed my life up. I cannot do this on my own. I need your help. I'm telling you, God's a very present help in the time of trouble. If we'll lift up our eyes eyes unto the hills from whence cometh our help I serve a God it's not a man that he should lie neither the son of man that he should repent he'll take you if you ask you will receive if you'll seek you will find if you knock it shall be open unto you praise God I'm talking about a God that would take a new heart and he can be able to pour into you the things that he desires to have into your life some of some of us try to take our old papers that he's painting, he's doing artist work on, and we try to allow him to add to it. But you see, God won't do that. God's not going to add to your junk. See, a lot of times we try to get him to add to that because we still think we need to add something to it. But I want to let you know, if we've messed our life up, how about letting somebody else do it? Allow God to do it. Something other else that the Lord began to show me was is that his work cannot be stopped by the enemy. As I think back of Jeremiah, the Bible said that, you know, God laid it upon Jeremiah, Jeremiah's heart to go rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. The holy city of God, the church that represents the body of Christ. 
go back and rebuild the walls and he had a purpose in his heart and God began to work on the other end with the leader that he was working for and the king and he was the king's cupbearer and he left and he went to the to the uh, city of Jerusalem he began to look over he began to fast he began to pray he began to get ideas from God because when we're working for God we don't wake up no more and make our own decisions it's not my life my my life my body's been bought by a price I'm here to glorify God there's so many people that are saved and still making their own decisions. I'll get married if I want to get married. You get married if God tells you to get married. I'll take this job if I want to take this job. You better take that job if God tells you to take that job. Come on, help me preach today. There's too many times we're making our own decisions and then when we get in trouble, we wonder where God's at. We should have put God at the point of asking Him, what should I choose? The Bible says, choose you this day whom you serve. But for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. And the Bible said when Jeremiah got down there and he began to try to rebuild Nehemiah. I'm sorry I got the name wrong. Nehemiah. Nehemiah got down there and he began to try to rebuild the walls that Samballot and, and all the enemies began to try to come against him. And the Bible said that they were some people who had a mind to work. Oh my God. What would the church look like in the midst of a coronavirus if the children of God had a mind to work? I praise God the other day I heard from my, my great aunt. You know, she's always got a heart to do something. But it blessed my heart that not only her but other people in this time of, was making masks. They running out of masks but they were homemade making mask and sewing together mask and putting coffee filters on the inside and for the nurse that lets me know that they had them nurse on their mind what would it do if the church was to rise up in the midst of this situation and begin to want to feed the hungry and, and pray for the sick oh my God if we had a mind to work God says I will work for our country a lot of people wonder where God's at right now God's mighty silent. Where's the church? The church is, they might can shut the doors down to the church, but I come to tell you something, they can't shut the church down because we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And no matter if the church doors are closed down, our doors are always open. Amen. Just witnessed to somebody the other day, the Lord laid upon my heart. They didn't want to hear it, but that's okay. I cannot do everybody else's part. All I can do is my part. You do what God lays upon your heart, and I'm here to tell you, that it cannot be stopped by the enemy. There's so many times, man, we get frustrated because we go to try to do something for God and all of a sudden we feel opposition from the enemy. I want to let you know that if you don't feel opposition from the enemy, more than likely it ain't God's work. Because Satan's always had something against God. From the beginning, he's always tried to kill God's men. He's always tried to kill the baby Jesus. He's always been against ministry if you're doing things out there today and you have no opposition against it it might not be God's work because Satan will allow you to work on your own because he knows it won't come to pass but when God gives you a vision and God gives you a dream and you begin to put your hand to the gospel plow and begin to work for the Lord you can look out there will be opposition but I come to encourage the church today that Jesus said upon this rock will I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it the Bible said in Psalm 127, it says, Unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain. What are we building in our lives? What's God's laid upon our lives? What, what has God laid upon our hearts and dreams and things of this nature? Is it God-given dreams? I don't want to dream another dream. I ain't got time. I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm getting, I'm getting on up into the age. I, I'm not going to be here very long. Life is but a vapor. The Bible said we got three score and ten of the days of man. And after that, it's labor and sorrow. Some of us is already close to our 70s. Some of us may be over our 70s. We need to be looking forward to leaving out of here and laying up treasures up in heaven where dust or moth doesn't corrupt. Can I get an amen today? We don't have time to dream our own dreams. We don't have time to waste another moment. We need to redeem the time for the days are evil. We need to put our hands to the black plow and not look back. Satan wants you to turn around. He's coming against you, Nehemiah. You're trying to do something for the Lord. You're trying to build something for God. But I'm here to tell you that there's going to be opposition. There will always be a sand ballot. There will always be a Judas. There will always be a King Herod. I don't know what your opposition is, but I'm here to tell you that God is the same. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If He brought them through, He can also bring us through. And no matter what you go through, no matter, no, matter, no matter what opposition you come against, I want to encourage you, God, lay that upon my heart today to let my people know 
that there's no opposition that can come against the church. Go back and read the book of Revelation in the book of, tri- in the book of Revelation during the tribulation period of how hard it's going to be. The Bible tells us that nations will rise up against nations. There will be famines and earthquakes and pestilence and divers places. But he said when you see these things begin to happen, don't get depressed. The Bible said these things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have tribulation. But in the world you should have tribulation, but in me you might have peace. The Bible tells us that I give you peace, not as the world give it. Give I unto you, let not your heart be troubled. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'm coming back again to receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. We need a church that'll lift their heads up and say, my redemption's drawing nigh. It's about time to step from this place to glory. It's a time to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Too many times things like this gets the church down because it's too hard. It's too hard to set PA systems up on the outside. It's too hard to stream online. It's too hard to try to witness. It's too hard to go buy groceries. It's too hard to find toilet paper. It's too hard to find cleaning supplies. It's too hard to buy groceries. It's too hard to stand out on the line. I believe everybody's trying to do their very best in these trying times when we have opposition come against the church. I want to let you know that they cannot prevail against us. You keep your nose to the grindstone. Work hard every day for the Lord and find out what it is is God would like to do in this hour we're living in. We're living in the last days, church. It's very easy to see that. But even in the last days, God's got a work for us to do. Acts chapter 2, 17 through 21 is a prophecy that came from Joel. It said, and it came to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And upon my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before that great notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass, this is what we need to hear, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That lets me know that He's going to give me His Spirit. Yes, there's come. There's going to come a great falling away. You know what God showed me? For some of you who have been at Oak Grove Assembly of God for the time that I've pastored, you remember a prophecy that I gave years ago. I've never been much of a prophecy. I don't know if it was a prophecy or if it was a word of knowledge. But the Lord showed me when I about four or five years ago that, that He was going to do something at Oak Grove Assembly of God that was going to be bigger than He ever has done before. And that wasn't because I was pastoring. He just gave me the vision. But I also said this. That we were going to go through something that we've never experienced before. How many remembers that? Amen. And just the other morning I was praying. I was meditating upon this thing that's going around. I said, God, what is going on? And he brought that back to my remembrance because I thought it might have been a church split. I thought it might. I didn't know what he was talking about that we were going to go through something that we've never been through before. But the Holy Ghost spoke to my heart the other day and he said, this is the thing that I told you about years ago. But even in the prophecy, he said he was going to do something at Oak Grove that he's never been done before. I come to encourage the church. I know it's hard. I know it's perilous time, but I serve a God that wants to shine in the dark as he said that he was called to be the light of the world. Amen. So whatever God lays upon our heart to do, church, listen, it is so vital that you obey God right now. You need to have a secret place. You need to have a private place that you can get to and ask God, God, what do you want from me in this hour? A lot of folks will say, well, I've just been called to go home and just stay isolated. Uh, Hey, you search your heart. If God says you to do that, and you obey God. But I don't believe God's calling us to be isolated. We're to reach out, man. We got technology. We got ways of encouraging people. Ways of helping people. Look at look at my great aunt and others. that sew. Who would have ever thought of sewing a mask? Who would have ever thought of a drive through church? I don't know who came up with this, but isn't it a good idea? That at least we still get to assemble ourselves together. Everybody be, can be created. We have the Spirit of God inside of us, and He says, you're my paper. You're my paper. You're drawing. And, and I want to let you know today that there's going, to come, there's going to come things against you and adversity and opposition against you. But I want to let you know that greater is He that is in you than he that is in this world. You're able to overcome. You're more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes, the enemy. So many people get frustrated and want to give up and want to quit when the enemy comes in. It's not a time to quit. You need to know that these things 
things are going to come. The Bible said, think it not strange, brethren, concerning the fiery trials which are to try you as though some strange thing happened. Man, when a dark comes our way, it gets us so depressed and we want to quit. It's not time to quit. It's the time to put on the whole armor of God and say, I'm in a battle, but the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Fight the good fight of faith. I love what Paul said. Paul was in prison. Paul had opposition against him. He wanted to serve the Lord. But just because you want to serve the Lord, just because you want to work for the Lord, it may not always go like you think it ought to go. And who would have ever thought the day that God struck Paul off his high horse and gave him blind, uh, made him blind, the light of the glory of God blinded him. And then he gave him the Holy Ghost. He filled him with the Spirit of God. And he began to preach the gospel and raise the dead and heal the sick and cast out demons who would have ever thought the Paul the apostle would be locked up for the rest of his days to be crucified who who would have ever thought that Paul probably surely didn't think that and Paul had this 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 mindset for me to live as Christ and for me to die as gain you're not hurting me by locking me up I'll just write a Bible come on somebody he was very creative behind jail cells you think sometimes that jail cells can stop Christians who knows what this world the Bible prophesies that we will be locked up before this things over. There's a lot of prophecies going around about these types of things happen that the next thing you know it's going to bring in the the the, the antichrist, the, the mark of the beast. They're, they're prophesying. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not knowledge enough to preach in that area. And I don't like preaching upon something that I don't know. But Miss Kathy sent me a text the other day of a man that really made a lot of sense because it just don't make no sense to me that all of a sudden a virus popped up out of the middle of nowhere and you know we got something now that we don't have a cure for. But he says, and I'm not preaching it for myself, but he says that there's eugenics, or however you pronounce that word, that, that believe in the world's overpopulated and all to do with the heat of the atmosphere and all the things that are coming. And there was rich people that had a private meeting that even talked about this coronavirus that began to try to make up a virus to try. I don't know how they do it, but it makes a lot of sense. And and I felt like this the other day before I ever heard him that with this thing happening, they're going to end up trying to come up with immunization shots to give you to make you take it. They've even though he talked about putting a chip inside of your body that they can keep up with you. One world order. Prophets after prophets are preaching. I'm not preaching that. What I'm trying to say is today that, that uh, whenever they talked about the mark of the beast, 666, you've heard of that number in the book of Revelation. In the last days, they'll put the mark of the beast. You'll have to have the mark. You'll have to have the mark to be able to eat, buy, sell, or trade. Uh, you know, I prayed that the church is not here at that time. I believe the rapture will take place before that happens. We are a pre-tribulation rapture. We believe in getting out of here because we have not been appointed under wrath. But we shall suffer persecution. But the reason that I believe what he was saying about the mark of the beast is because some of you may know that Chris guy, the reporter that they've been showing online. He's got this virus and he's been trying to encourage people and try to show you that you can make it through it. But he stated something the other night while he was live online and, and, and talking about his fever and stuff of this nature that he was going through. He made a comment and he said, they're calling this the beast. Maybe some of you have heard that. They're calling this virus the beast. And it just, reco it, it just recollected in my mind that when this preacher began to talk about this, that soon they'll end up going to immunization shots to make everybody take it. Why? Because they, you know, they think, well, you got to have it. And, and, and this is part of the eugenics or whoever they are. I don't know. But what I'm trying to say is I, I'm talking about a lot of stuff that I don't know a whole lot about. But I do know this, that even in the midst of all that stuff, that when the church is still down here, God is still at work in America. And we need to make sure that we are in Christ. If you're not in Christ today, you need to make that, that, that appointment. God's doing a work that cannot be stopped by the enemy. I didn't say that you wouldn't have opposition. Isaiah 54 and 17 says this. No weapon that is formed against us shall be able to prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against us in judgment, thou shalt condemn. For this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. But the thing about it is a lot of people think because that scripture said there's no weapon formed against us shall prosper that there would be no weapon formed. That ain't what the Bible said. 
He didn't say the weapon wouldn't be formed. He didn't say the weapon wouldn't come. That word prosper means successful. That means that when he throws his fiery darts at you, that you have enough of armor on that you can take the lick that the Satan takes you and you can still be able to prosper in the midst of it. I'm here to tell you, Paul had to fight a good fight. If he had to fight a good fight, we better be in our prayer closets getting the armor on so we can fight a good fight. Amen. Last but not least today, the rewards that God gives us for our work is more than what we deserve. He works for other people, gives them things that we don't deserve. But He laid this upon my heart that if you really want to be successful at working for the Lord, you got to take your time to rest. Too many times we get burnt out. There are some people out there that works too hard, that burns themselves out. God didn't need no rest, but everything He done in the Word of God was for our example. And we all know six days He worked, and what He do the seventh day? He rested. Amen. There's so many times that we think, you know, I just stated it last, uh, stated last Sunday, and, and I hope and pray this is not a 9-11 situation where everybody's just freaking out, you know, we're trying to panic, trying to get our souls right, trying to get right with God, and then all of a sudden if it smooths over, we just go back to living how we want to live. Through this generation that I'm living in, I talk to other pastors whose doors are closing. Pastors are leaving ministry. Why? Because it's so hard to get people to come to church in this generation. In the early 1900s, church doors were filled up. I wondered why we had so many churches down the road. They had to have so many churches back then. People packed, the, that was back during the Depression days when people really didn't have nothing else to do. They went to the house of the Lord. I've even heard some tell me I went to get a date. <laughs> They went to hear some singing. They, but nevertheless, they was in the house of the Lord. Nowadays, we have every entertainment to keep us entertained. And I'm hoping and praying, I thank God for this Facebook too, that we're able to reach people. But my fear is that people will get in a bad habit of this. And whenever times go back to normal, they say, Well, I've watched him at home for a month and a half now. I'll continue watching him at home. What gets me is that some people can't make it to church on Wednesday nights, but they'd rather watch online on Wednesday nights. We think that putting our keys in the ignition is too hard for us because I make it one day a week. I hope and pray that we will take time out of our busy schedule to rest and put God first in our lives. Don't let your church attendance be sorry. If you showed up every day for your job this past week, why can't you show up every time the house of God's open? Well, I got this to do, Brother Brandon. I got that to do. That's what's wrong with us. I feel like the Lord wants me to drive this point in. That's what's wrong with us. This world and this country has become too busy for God. It has amazed me over the years that the people that can go to Walmart but can't go to church. You see people all over Walmart talking about I'm sick. I had a little sniffling nose today. I didn't want to spread it to nobody. Are you kidding me? Walmart's got bukoodles of people compared to church. I've seen people tell me that they got a little snuffy nose. They don't want to. They don't want to take it to nobody. But Monday morning, they always seem to get better. Why? Because church is on Sundays. Too many times it's too hard to get out of bed, and I'm too tired. And preacher, I just been going through some stuff, and I really didn't feel like going this morning. A lot of people call shut-in shut-ins that ain't really shut-ins. They get out all in the yard. They walk all over the place. They go to Piggly Wiggly. They go to Winn Dixie. They go to Walmart, but they call themselves shut-in because I can't sit there that long, brother Brandon. But rather, they sit on front of a TV in a recliner all day long. Some people sleep in a recliner but they can't come to the house of God I'm telling you there's going to come a time you're going to desire to go to the house of God and while we have that time we ought to go I have missionaries and I've, I've said this before but I have missionaries that have to have church under, under underground we ought to be thankful that we live in a country that still has the freedom to go worship but the thing about it is we've not taken enough time to rest to go to the house of God. Rest from our work and enter into His work. I never thought that taking off on Sundays could benefit me financially the way it does. Well, I just got to work. You just don't understand my bills. You'd be better off if you didn't. 
I ain't trying to, I ain't trying to condemn people because we're not to judge people for the Sabbath days and things of this nature. I understand that we're under the new covenant. I still believe in the commandments, but it, it, a lot of people say, a lot of people condemn people for the Sabbath day, but this ain't really the Sabbath day. <laughs> Jewish, the Jewish Sabbath day was on Saturday. So before you condemn people for on working on Sundays, this, that, and other, because they're working on Sabbath day, get your days right. You got your days wrong. But I still believe we need to practice a Sabbath day principle. God did it. He didn't do it because he was tired. Psalm 121 teaches us the Holy One of Israel neither slumbers nor sleep. God is not a man that he gets tired. He's not a man that he gets weary. But he chose to do it in the creation of earth to let us know we need one day to rest. We need one day of worship. We need one day of praise. We need one day set aside, sanctified, set aside. That's why he said, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Keep it set apart. Don't let things become another routine on the Sabbath day. I'll just do this on Sunday, and I'll do that on Sunday, and I'll do Listen, whenever this thing blows away, praise God for the people who are coming. I thank God. I don't believe you can catch a virus in your truck. If you catch a virus in your truck, then you're just in trouble. We're all in trouble. You're going to catch it in your house then. But I thank God for the ones who came out. But listen, when this thing's all over with, let our church attendance be the same way it is now. When everything goes back to running and all business begin to open back up, say, you know what? If I'd done without it a month and a half, I can do without it now. They try to make me feel better when deer season come in. Say, Brother Brandon, you just got to understand deer season in. Don't get discouraged. No, I'm very discouraged because I see that people love deer more than they love God. There's nothing wrong with hunting. I hunt myself. But when it comes time to go to the house of the Lord, I don't want to have an animal put before my God. Amen. Don't get discouraged, Brother Brandon. Fishing season's right around the curve. I got a boat. I like to fish my own self. But the day that I put a boat and a fish before my God, I pray that he takes it slap away from me. I hope and pray that I can't pay for my boat. I hope I lose it because I never want to gain the world and lose my own soul. God wants to do a work in our life. But don't judge it before it's through. Some of you got kids you've been praying for. You say, God, I want you to save them. Maybe it's scaring you here lately because it's getting bad. Sometimes it makes it worse before it gets better. But just remember, God knows what he's doing with that artist brush. He's painting you a pretty picture. Don't get around him and tell him he don't know what he's doing. He's been doing this for years. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. So I'll bow our heads for a word of prayer. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the Bible said if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God rose Jesus from the dead, we will be saved. Repent of our sins. If you've got sin in your life, you know you got sin in your life, you know what? I don't know what the futures hold. They're talking about locking down all kind of folk, this, that, and other. But if I have to sit around the house, I'm going to start doing a Bible study about every day God laid upon my heart. I don't know. I hope and pray we continue to work. I hope they let us. I don't know what's going to take place. But if everybody's sitting around the house, I don't want to just say, I want to do a Bible study. Because I believe there's a lot of people in this generation think they're going to heaven, but they're not going. And the reason is, is because they don't search the scriptures. And I just would like to put that online. But Father, I pray today that you would allow us, God, continue allowing us to come to your house at least once a week. And I want to thank you because when I looked at the radar last, this past week, it was supposed to rain today. And it rained um, sometime through the night, sometime early this morning, but now you've blessed us with pretty weather. I continue praying for the days ahead. I don't know what will happen or take place if it rains. That's going to be very challenging on us with all this equipment. So I thank you, Father, for being our provider even in these perilous times, Lord. I pray, God, for somebody out there that don't know you, God, that they'll call upon your name, they'll repent of their sin, and allow you the opportunity to work in our lives. You've done a good work in me. You're not through with me yet, but I'm thankful for what you're doing in my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give the Lord some praise before we leave. There we go. God bless you. Tune in Wednesday night online, 630. We'll be coming live. Lord be in will. We'll be back next Sunday at 1030. God bless you.